Okay, we might make a start. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Glaucoma Australia uh, live stream. Uh, my name is Matthew Wells. Uh, I'm an ophthalmologist. I'm based here in Sydney, uh, and I've got a special interest in glaucoma. Um, it's a real privilege uh, to be speaking to you today as part of the World Glaucoma Awareness Week uh, in an effort to raise awareness about this disease because it's still one of the most common causes of preventable blindness, both worldwide and here in Australia. So there've been some terrific talks already this week. Uh, and if you haven't checked them out already, I'd highly recommend them to you. There've been some really interesting topics such as glaucoma and driving, uh, glaucoma and OCT. Um, so if you haven't checked them out already, go and have a look on the glaucoma website. So the topic I'll be speaking on today is the interaction between systemic conditions and glaucoma. So we should have some time at the end, uh, so you can, we'll go over some common questions that come up in this area. Uh, and you can also type in some of your questions in the comment section down below. I'm just gonna check that we're coming through loud and clear. Um, and it looks like it's all going nicely. So how can systemic conditions interact with glaucoma? Well, before we answer that question, uh, I thought it might be a good time to go back and recap some of the basic principles in our current understanding of the causes of glaucoma so we're all on the same page. So this recap I think will be very useful as we then go back and try and make the link between some systemic conditions and glaucoma. So most of you listening out there would know glaucoma is a disease of the optic nerve, so we all know that. And the optic nerve is a very important part of the visual system that connects the eyeball back to the brain. And so obviously any damage in this, in this cable that joins the two is gonna cause visual system, visual problems. And the most common one we see is loss of your peripheral vision. So I think it's worth mentioning here that our understanding of the exact causes of glaucoma are still evolving. We still don't have the whole story. The reality is, is there probably uh, multiple causes that affect susceptible people in different ways, resulting in the same effect, which is damage to the nerve. So what we do know at the most basic level is that glaucoma is a, is, is a result of damage to the retinal ganglion cells. Sorry, I'm just making sure that we're still going well. So we do know that at the most basic level, glaucoma is damage to the retinal ganglion cells. So these are a very special type of cell in the visual system, and they're like little internet cables that join the photoreceptors, so the bits, the part of the eye that do the seeing, all the way back to the visual cortex in the brain. So what causes this death is still not absolutely known. So we do have some theories about, what, um, about the cause, which we'll go through now, and most likely there's actually quite a bit of interplay amongst them all. One that I'm sure most of you are most familiar with is high mechanical damage theory. So we've got the idea that you've got this very high pressure pushing against the nerve and physically damaging those retinal ganglion cells as they pass through the optic nerve uh, and there's actually a very sort of special area called the lamina cabrosa and it's like a little sieve like structure where the, the, the nerve have to pass into and this is where that mechanical damage is most likely occurring. Um, it's thought this mechanical stress goes on to initiate a whole other cascade of further damage but we're still working on trying to find out exactly what the cause is. But as some of you will know even pressure with even people, patients with normal pressure can still go on to get glaucoma. So there must be some other factors at play. So one of the main other theories about the development of glaucoma is the vascular insufficiency theory. So just like any other organ in the body, the optic nerve requires exceptionally good blood supply. And some researchers think that this having an insufficient blood supply contributes to glaucoma. So there's many systemic conditions uh, that affect our vascular system, and we'll actually spend some time talking about those 
uh, later on in this presentation. So glaucoma has also been studied in the context of neurodegenerative disorders, such as Alzheimer's disease. And some researchers actually think there might be some shared mechanisms. Um, so this is known as the neurodegenerative theory. Um, and there's also renewed interest in the autoimmune and inflammatory causes of optic nerve damage. So this is when your own body produces cells and chemical messages that go on to attack the ganglion cells. I think it's also worth mentioning that more and more, we're also understanding the role of genetics in glaucoma. And this is a really emerging field. Um, and so far we've identified genes that have been linked with uh, early onset glaucoma, a predisposition for higher pressure generally, and some of the more really quite aggressive types of subtypes of glaucoma. All right, so look, I hope I haven't overwhelmed you there uh, with too much sort of jargon or medical terms. Um, but I thought that little recap in the understanding of our current theories of glaucoma uh, would be really helpful now as we make the stepping stone to look at the overlap between glaucoma and some of the more common systemic conditions we have in, here in Australia, uh, namely high blood pressure and diabetes. So first of all, let's talk about one of the, a very common systemic issue here in Australia, um, which is high blood pressure. Uh, so I looked up the Australian Bureau of Statistics website and I found out that 34% of the Australian population have high blood pressure. So as we've just heard about, the, one of the main working theories on the pathogenesis or cause of glaucoma is this vascular insufficiency theory. It makes a lot of sense that if the blood supply uh, is under stress from high blood pressure, there might be a higher risk of getting glaucoma. Um, and this was actually backed up in one of the most famous uh, eye studies that was done here in Australia, uh, the Blue Mountains Eye Study. Uh, and in that study, it was found that you've got a, so a one and a half times greater chance of having glaucoma than those who don't have high blood pressure. So let's, let's unpack this a little bit more. Um, so we do know that high blood pressure damages the inner linings of the blood vessels throughout the body. So not just in the eye, um, but everywhere. And this inner lining is known as the endothelium. Um, and the, this endothelium, um, the small vessels are really susceptible to this damage. Um, the damage to the lining of the endothelium can get so bad that the vessels can actually become blocked and stop working. So this obviously means that um, any area that that vessel was supplying uh, is no longer working well. And the structures uh, that it was supplying um, can become stressed or damaged. Uh, so I thought it was actually really interesting uh, that researchers think that high blood pressure initially might be protective to the optic nerve head circulation because you've got this very high pressure shunting the blood in, ensuring very good perfusion of the optic nerve head. Um, but this advantage is actually only very uh, short-lived because eventually we see that damage to the endothelium and compromise the vascular supply of the nerve. Um, so let's talk about the next topic. What about low blood pressure? Um, well, we have seen that in some population-based studies, um, we've seen that episodes of very low blood pressure can also be associated with glaucoma progression. So the times when people are most likely to have low blood pressure uh, is when they've been put on blood pressure medication that's inadvertently dropping their blood pressure down very low uh, when they're asleep at night. So um, if we think about it, this makes sense. Um, if we're talking, we're just talking about the perfusion of the optic nerve and just like any other organ, if the optic nerve isn't getting a nice even blood supply, um, then it's gonna be in a stress state uh, and this is not helpful uh, in a nerve that's already compromised. So while we're talking about vascular insufficiency, uh, let's get on to two of the other uh, extremely common conditions, um, diabetes and obstructive sleep apnea. Um, so when I was preparing for this talk, I found uh, these quite impressive statistics uh, from a paper in America. Uh, and it said that in the US population, glaucoma is prevalent in 20% of those with obstructive sleep apnea and 10% in those with type two diabetes. So it was 2.6 in a normal 
population. I'll just say that again. So it was prevalent in 20% of those with obstructive sleep apnea and 10% of those with type 2 diabetes. Um, so that's an incredible many times risk factor in, in those two conditions. Um, so just by way of explanation, uh, obstructive sleep apnea is a condition where you stop breathing in your sleep. Uh, and this can be for a number of reasons. Um, but during these periods, um, your blood oxygenation drops down uh, and your tissues go into a state of low oxygen supply and become, this causes a lot of stress on your whole body. Um, and if we go back to thinking about our vascular sort of blood supply, oxygen supply theory uh, as to one of the causes of uh, glaucoma, um, then this poor oxygenation fits in very well. So that brings us on uh, to one of our next most common, uh, commonly seen diseases, which is diabetes. Um, and most of you would know that diabetes is essentially uh, a disease of impaired blood sugar um, that results in uh, high blood sugar levels for most of the time floating in your blood. Uh, and the problem with elevated blood sugar is that it also damages the sensitive inner linings of the blood vessels throughout the body. And this is actually much the same way as high blood pressure does. Um, so you could actually give an entire talk uh, about diabetes and the eye um, because its effects are, are really quite far ranging uh, in ophthalmology. Um, and the association between glaucoma uh, and diabetes is quite a complex one. Um, but again, it's thought to be related uh, to the ischemia of the optic nerve from that small vessel damage related to the high blood sugar. Uh, so interestingly, uh, just like high blood pressure uh, is also thought to be initially beneficial, um, high blood sugar is also thought to be neuroprotective. So protecting you for getting glaucoma um, initially before you get to see the damage to the vascular supply of the nerve. Um, at this stage, I thought uh, it might be a good time to mention um, another association between diabetes and glaucoma. Um, and that's the way that severe diabetic eye disease uh, can lead to neovascular glaucoma. So that's different to the open angle glaucoma that we've been talking about up until now. Um, and neovascular glaucoma is one of the most uh, aggressive and severe and hard to treat types of glaucoma. Uh, and it actually occurs when the eye becomes so deprived of oxygen from that small vessel damage that it actually tries to grow its own uh, blood supply and its own blood vessels um, to furnish that, that lack of supply. So um, these new vessels that the eye grows are actually defective and they're very leaky and they cause problems throughout the eye. Um, but they actually eventually grow into the part of the eye that's responsible for aqueous drainage or aqueous outflow of the eye. Um, these new vessels cause scarring and then essentially there's actually no way for the aqueous to leave the eye and the pressure becomes very, very high. Uh, and because that outflow uh, has been scarred down, the treatment is very, very difficult. Uh, and this type of glaucoma often requires laser or surgery to get it under control. Um, so just by way of recap, we see diabetes having a chronic relationship with glaucoma from that small vessel damage. Uh, but it can also have an acute um, effect where the angle becomes closed and scarred and the pressure becomes very, very high. So there's actually uh, many systemic diseases and we're just skimming over the top of them today. Uh, I've talked about the sort of major, most or the more, more commonly, so commonly encountered ones in Australia. Um, and there's actually, there's a few other ones that uh, are linked to glaucoma through their secondary pressure uh, elevating effects. Um, and I'll go through a couple of those conditions now. So um, HLA B27 uh, uveitis is a, is a condition that we see commonly. Um, and in that condition, uh, again, talking about the part of the eye that's responsible for the fluid draining, uh, that becomes inflamed or blocked by um, the inflammatory cells and the pressure can become very, very high. Um, and we see a similar type picture uh, in a lot of infections. So uh, shingles or herpes zoster can create the same problem with a hypertensive uveitis. Um, and that can also be seen in uh, 
same virus that causes cold sores, so herpes simplex. Um, thyroid eye disease is a, an, another sort of commonly encountered uh, condition in the community, and it creates problems uh, with pressure through its mechanical effects uh, in the orbit because the muscles become very swollen, uh, the fat can become swollen, um, and the pressure becomes elevated. Um, there's actually quite a few congenital conditions, so ones that you probably haven't heard of, uh, like Marfan syndrome, uh, Sturge Weber syndrome, uh, neurofibromatosis, uh, that also have very, very strong associations with glaucoma. Um, and it's also worth mentioning uh, that there's many medications that can be associated with glaucoma. So um, corticosteroids are probably the most common ones that are used in the community. Uh, they can increase pressure. Uh, and there's actually some other medications that can cause physical changes in the eye, um, like topiramate and topiramate, and that can actually really increase pressure in the acute setting. All right, well, I feel like I've done lots and lots of talking. Um, what I thought we could do is uh, I'll go through a couple of common questions now. And then if you uh, give me a minute or two, I'll have a look at some of the questions that have been uh, sent through now, and we can talk about some of those. Um, so we often get uh, asked about lasers in glaucoma and um, the difference between uh, laser for glaucoma and laser in diabetes. And the main uh, use of lasers in the diabetes is to treat peripheral retina. Um, so by applying some laser to the peripheral retina, usually we reduce the oxygen demand of the eye and that reduces the risk of those dangerous new vessels forming and creating all the problems we talked about. So this is in contrast uh, to the lasers we use uh, in glaucoma. So there's two lasers we use. Um, some of you or out there may have already had SLT. So that stands for Selective Laser Trabecularplasty. Uh, and in that, um, with that laser, uh, we apply energy again to the angle. So the, that's the part of the eye responsible for allowing aqueous to flow out. And that uh, rejuvenates those cells, gets them working better and often lowers the pressure. Um, the other layer, laser that we use in glaucoma um, is in the acute type of glaucoma, acute angle closure. Uh, and that's to create a pathway uh, or sort of a passage, a little hole in the iris, uh, and that tends to try and equalise the pressure between the back and the and the front and the back chambers in the eye, and that tends to uh, break that um, angle, that closed angle attack. Um, so that's a bit of a summary of lasers in diabetes versus lasers in glaucoma. Um, and the other question that tends to come up uh, quite frequently. Uh, from my patients is um, the interaction between macular degeneration injections, um, so the anti-VEGF injections, and is that affecting my intraocular pressure? So um, the eye is a very, very uh, small volume, and even though the volume that we give in the intraocular injections for macular degeneration is tiny, um, it still does increase the intraocular pressure in the short term. There's no question about that. And most of the ophthalmologists who use those injections will give you a little test. So we check, can you see my fingers? How many fingers have I got? Um, and that just is a double check to ensure that the pressure hasn't shot up so high um, that it's uh, stopping from blood flowing into the eye. <clears throat> so um, in the acute setting, we know that the pressure does spike up a bit. Um, but in most eyes, the function uh, and the intraocular pressure feedback loop is good enough to normalise that pressure. So uh, if you are a patient with uh, severe glaucoma, who's also been treated uh, with uh, macular degeneration injections, um, look, that's a really tough situation to be in. Um, but hopefully you are in a good relationship with your treating ophthalmologist and you can talk through some of the risks and benefits of trying to protect both your peripheral vision and also your central vision with your macular degeneration. Um, so if you would bear with me for one moment, I might just have a look at 
some of the messages that have come through here. Um, and we can talk a few about a few of those. Um, so, interestingly, um, someone's asked about thyroid eye disease um, and high pressure. So hopefully uh, the talk has answered that somewhat. So um, just to recap, uh, in thyroid eye disease, we typically see swelling of the uh, extraocular muscles and often there's some inflammation of the orbital fat. Um, and these two uh, occurrences tend to uh, increase the, um, the pressure around the eye and this can reduce the uh, rate at which the aqueous is absorbed and increases the pressure in the eye. So um, there's, abs there's no question that uh, if you have thyroid eye disease, uh, your ophthalmologist should be uh, well and truly following you for, for glaucoma. Um, and uh, let's go through some of the other ones. So how is my blood pressure related to my eye pressure? Um, this is uh, another interesting one um, where we've seen uh, problems with high blood pressure causing, um, uh, can increase pressure uh, in the eye. Um, and again, systemic control of blood pressure um, is beneficial both from an eye pressure point of view and from a, a small vessel disease point of view. Um, so hopefully uh, that is also one of the main underlying things you hear me saying today is that um, the better you control any systemic disease, um, the more protective that's going to be uh, for your glaucoma as well. Um, so uh, an interesting one here from Eva. Uh, so my grandson is being tested for glaucoma and the doctor has asked to see my notes. Does my glaucoma affect his treatment and management? Um, so I think that brings up uh, a very, very important point. Um, and that is that family history has been shown to be highly predictive uh, in glaucoma. And uh, that is no question related to the genetic um, component uh, of glaucoma and we're learning more and more about that. Um, but if you do have a family history of glaucoma, um, it's essential that you get all of your, uh, all of your family tested um, because that has been shown to be um, highly related to your family history. Um, well, I think uh, that answers most of the questions that have been sent through. Um, I think I'll leave it there. Um, please continue to make uh, glaucoma awareness a priority. Uh, thank you for having me today. I've really enjoyed uh, speaking to you all. Um, and thank you to Glaucoma Australia uh, for organising all these fantastic events this week uh, and for the great work they do throughout the year. Take care.